Uh, my name is Captain Dylan Hubbard from Hubbard's Marina. Uh, Hubbard's Marina has been fishing local water since 1928, over 90 years and four generations. We do a little bit of everything from inch or, uh, near shore to offshore fishing, and uh, we do uh, a lot of different party boat style trips, and we also do private charter style trips. And today we're going to talk a little bit about near shore and offshore fishing. So uh, anything from the beach out to about a thousand foot of water is what we kind of specialize in. Uh, but we work with a lot of people uh, to also do any type of fishing you want, from gator hunting to fly fishing to inshore fishing. Uh, we do it all. So it makes it real, really easy for you to go to one place and get on a boat and go fishing. So we're going to talk today mainly about that near shore and offshore fishing and uh, mostly about uh, grouper, snapper, amberjack, and what's going on now. We always like to start it off by talking about what we're catching now, and right now it's amberjack season. Amberjack season opened up August 1st, and they're open August, September, and October. So we have three months to catch those jacks. We also have gag grouper open now. They're open through the end of the year, so we're catching those uh, gag grouper and targeting those fish. Uh, now, right now, it's kind of warm, so those gags are definitely out in deeper water. Anywhere from about 200 foot of water uh, out to about 250 foot of water is where we're seeing a majority of those gag grouper caught. You can catch them as shallow as about 150, 160 foot, uh, but it's definitely better. The deeper you go, the better that gag grouper fishing is. We're also seeing those scam grouper mixed in with those gags. We're seeing some red grouper action, too. Now the red grouper bite overall this year has definitely been a lot lower than what is normally expected. Typically this time of year, five, six years ago, we'd be catching a lot of red grouper, even in shallow 35, 40 foot water all the way out to about 110, 120. We just haven't seen that really big push of red grouper. They, they say that the red grouper population is not doing too well. Our catches definitely reflect that. So that's one bad thing that we're seeing out there, but besides that, the gags, the scam, the amberjack are making up for it. Near shore this time of year, a little bit few and far between as far as quality fish go because those red grouper have left that void. So anywhere from about 35, 40 foot of water out to about 100, 110 foot of water, the main quality fish that we're seeing in those depths would be the uh, mangrove snapper, the lane snapper, uh, some nice sized porgies, and the occasional red grouper. We're not, not seeing red grouper, we're just not seeing a lot of them. Now, what's, what's good, uh, that near shore area, we're starting to see that hogfish bite uptick. So as the water cools, the hogfish bite gets better and better and better and better, all the way through uh, March of next year. So those hogs are really, really fun to catch. They're a little tricky, but as the water cools, that hogfish bite's gonna just get better and better. So we're looking forward to that. Plus, we have the mackerel start coming back to the area. Behind the mackerel, we'll see the kingfish return to the area. And that's what makes the near shore fishing a lot of fun. Because not only are we catching those hogfish, but we're also seeing those mackerel and those kingfish come in on the flat lines while you're out there near shore. So all good stuff to look forward to this fall. As the water cools, kingfish coming back, gag groupers starting to come in shallower and get more aggressive, hogfish bite getting better. So all that's what's laying before us in the coming weeks. So great time to get out there. Plus, also, we slow down. There's less people out in the water. June and July, everybody and their brother is out in the boat fishing for those red snapper. Kids are out of school, boats are packed. It, it doesn't matter if you have your own boat or you're fishing with us in our boats, there's just a lot of people on the water in the summertime. Now that we're on the backside of summer, definitely a lot more room on our boats and a lot more room in the Gulf of Mexico, a lot less boats out there. So all good things to look forward to in the coming weeks. So for our fishing seminar today, I kind of like talking with you guys, not at you. So hopefully you guys have some questions for me. That way we can kind of talk about what you guys want to hear, what you guys want to talk about. So does anybody have a question? Okay. I want to go fishing there tomorrow. Nice. I don't know what I should use the Okay. So this question is about Ant Cloak Cove. So for me, I'm more near shore and offshore. So I focus mainly on that. But as far as inshore fishing goes right now along the coast, 
definitely the go-to thing would be snook. Snook is the most commonly caught fish around right now. Uh, the snook are really, really thick around the passes and on the beach. This time of year, those snook are spawning in our near shore waters. So the snook actually travel through the passes out to 30, 40, 50, 60 foot of water. And they congregate on top of those artificial wrecks and reefs and they spawn. So there's huge numbers of snook in the passes moving offshore and spawning. And those smaller fish are hanging on the beach and hanging around the passes and around the flats near the passes. So up and close, I don't know how many snook would be around there since that's kind of far from the passes. But we're at the backside of that summertime spawn, so a lot of some of those fish are starting to move back in. I know the North Shore Tampa Bay, South Shore Tampa Bay, they've been seeing a lot of snook. So if I was you tomorrow, I'd be targeting those snook on the flats. You'd want to be using something like a DOA shrimp. Uh, that's my favorite way to order. DOA makes that cow out of tail. Another great lure option. Uh, just dragging it slowly right along those grass flats, finding those pockets. Inshore fishing, the main things that I look for are you're looking for points, pockets, and passes. That, that's what kind of restricts the fish and makes it easier to target and catch. Especially this time of year with how, how hot the water is, those snook are going to be in that shallow grass flat. They're going to be hiding in that pocket, that little deeper part of the grass flat or that little channel where they can get a little deeper, the water's a little ch uh, chillier, and they're going to be able to be a little bit more frisky. I would avoid that midday time frame. The earlier you can get out there, the better. Uh, as the sun rises and as the sun sets, it's definitely where you're going to see the most action with the best bites. Pay attention to your timetables. You want to make sure the water's moving. You don't want to go out there when it's sitting still. The water's not moving, the sun's straight up in the sky. The fish aren't going to shoot. Just like us, if it's 100 degrees and you're sitting out in the sun, you're not going to want to eat a big old plate of food. But if it's nice and cool and the breeze is going, you're going to eat some food, right? Same idea. Same idea. Good question. Any other questions, guys? Yes, sir. Troll. Nice question there. Guys, real quick, I do want to remind y'all, if you are just showing up, make sure you come up and grab some raffle tickets. Cliff, do you still have a few more? You can go see Cliff and grab some raffle tickets, and uh, he'll get you set up there, guys. We are going to give away those free trips at the end of the seminar. You do have to have a raffle ticket. We'll be giving those away for another few minutes. For those of you guys who were here from the start, we won't give those raffle tickets away uh, once we're like 15, 20 minutes into this thing. That way we keep it fair. If you didn't show up for the beginning, I mean, you don't have to change the win. So, um, your question was about trolling. So, again, as I mentioned, those mackerel are starting to come back, so it's a great time to troll. Around Tampa Bay, those mackerel seem to stay here almost all year. So we have a lot of mackerel around the Skyway Piers. They definitely kind of get a little bit fewer and further between in the summertime. Uh, but now when we're on the backside of the summer, it definitely seems like those mackerel are starting to show back up. So you have mackerel to catch around this, uh, the channel there, the shipping channel, uh, around Egmont Key and even inside Egmont Key to the Skyway and even uh, north of the Skyway, you're seeing those mackerel. Plus, a lot of guys like trolling the shipping channel for those gag grouper. Now, right now, it's a little tough to find those gag grouper inside the bay. Uh, they're uh, definitely a little fewer and further between when the water's this hot. But we definitely have some gags in the shipping channel. People are still catching a few of them here and there. But as the water cools off, months ending in ER, October, November, December, that's when those gags really get thick around the shipping channel. Month of December, closest to the end of the month you can get when the bite's gonna be at the best. So there's two different methods that people use for trolling for those gag groupers. Uh, the main method that I would use uh, are something like these uh, lipped trolling plugs, something like the Rapala X-Wrap or these new uh, Nomad Design DTX Minnows. Basically what you're wanting to do with this thing is you want this thing bouncing along the bottom literally almost bouncing off the bottom, or bouncing off the bottom. The idea is, as this thing trolls by that little rocky ledge, or that little rock pile, those guys are gonna come out of their hole and smack it. 
Now, the trick with this is you want to make sure that it's right on or near the bottom. The way you do that is by using braided line. Braided line cuts through the water a little easier, and it gets that lure deeper. So if you're using monofilament, you're not going to get that plug as deep. You're not going to be as effective while trolling for those gags in the shipping channel. So you definitely want to use mono, or I mean braided line. Typically around 50 to 60 pound braid is the trick. That allows that uh, lure to cut through the water, get deep enough to hit the bottom. Also, the further behind the boat you put the plug, the deeper generally it's going to be able to get. So if you keep it real close to the back of the boat, it's not going to get as deep. The further back you put that plug, the deeper it dives. Uh, so you want to play with those distances and the size of the plug, and that's going to play with the depth of the plug to get into that strike zone. Once you get it dialed in, then you know what you're doing. The trick is getting dialed in, because depending on where you're fishing, the depth is going to change. And if the depth changes, you've got to change the distance from the back of the boat or change the plug that you're using. So it takes a little bit of practice to get it dialed in, but definitely the trick is using that braided line, and then you want to use about six to eight feet of floral carbon. So you do a line to line knot, tie a little piece of floral carbon on, and then put that plug on. That's the idea. You want to have a little shock absorber, and you also want to make sure that that fish is seeing that grain as that plug goes by. And then once you catch the fish, once you hook the fish, you want to make sure that whoever's driving the boat is paying attention. Because if you're trolling along the side of the channel, when you hook a fish here, you want to make sure that you come back around and fish and troll around that spot. Because those fish are going to stay on little ledges and rock piles on the edge of that channel. And there's typically going to be more than one of that area that you caught in. So when you catch one, you want to make sure that you're paying attention and that you're marking those spots that you're hooking that fish. Also keep it in mind that if you catch a, if you hook a fish, your boat might be here, but your trolling plugs are way down here. So if you mark the spot where you hooked it, you're not actually on top of that spot. So you want to keep that in mind as well. And then you want to troll, keep trolling that spot. And the trick with trolling that spot is Let's see, let's pretend this gentleman's head is that fishing spot. As you troll up to it, you want to make sure that you're kind of crossing the edge of it. So then as you cross the edge of it, I cut the wheel, and that will make sure that that trolling plug is cutting the edge of it, and as you cut the wheel, it cuts right across it. And the trick is you don't want to keep going over the same spot. You want to kind of do diagonals. A lot of guys will do the figure eights. Figure eight's my favorite method. You can make a long, slow turn. So when you got trolling plugs out the back of the boat, you can't make sharp turns. So you got to make a long, slooping, slow turn. And those figure eights work really well, being as though that middle of that figure eight being that spot that you're trying to target. And that'll help you to really dial in on that area and keep catching those fish that are willing to chew for you. Uh, besides the trolling plugs, you can also use the soft rub tails. So like the, the, what you would use for the snook in shore, but a much bigger, beefier version with a big old lead uh, jig head, like a jig head like this, but obviously much bigger, two to three ounce jig head with that big soft tail grub. The white seems to work really well, the chartreuse. One of those soft uh, curly tail uh, soft baits on one of those big jig heads is also a great trolling lure inside the bay too. But like I said, right now is not quite the time to do that. You want to definitely, October, November, December, once those cold fronts start, that water starts cooling down, that's the time you want to do it. This time of year, uh, more of those mackerel are around. But the mackerel, to target the mackerel, what we do with the mackerel is <coughs> uh, the mackerel love hitting these spoons behind the planer. So you put a planer on, and with the planer, that's going to bring that bait down to the bottom. And then you use these trolling spoons. And these trolling spoons work really well for the mackerel. And you put about 12 to 15 feet of monofilament between your spoon and the back of that planer. Anywhere from uh, 50 to about 60 pound test, monofilament. And you put, again, about 12 to 15 feet between the spoon and the back of the planer. Now, the back of the planer is this flat part of that planer. The ring on top of that planer is what goes to your main line. And so that planer is like an airplane wing, essentially. Let me see if I have one out of the package that I can show you a little bit more effectively. 
but as I was saying, it's more of like an airplane wing. So it, it uh, catches the water, and as you set that planer, it'll pull that jig down the bottom. I don't know if I have one unwrapped here. But they do work very effectively for trolling for mackerel, kingfish, bonita, a bunch of different uh, pelagic species love those spoons. And it works really well in the spring and fall when those mackerel are around, those kingfish will get mixed in with them, and that trolling uh, planer will work well. You can also use trolling weights to get those baits down further. This is the diving plug that I showed you, the hard plugs, they got that lip, and that lip is going to bring that bait down low enough. When you're using that soft curly tail plug with the jig head, it might not be heavy enough to hit bottom for you where you need it to for those guys. So you can always throw a trolling weight in front of it, and that works a lot better than these. That is some serious thunder. Uh, that works a lot better than these trolling planers because the planers, they typically cause a little bit too much vibration. Those gags are pretty smart. So if I was trolling for gags, instead of the planers that I like using for mackerel and kingfish, I would probably use a trolling weight. And they sell them right over here. You know what I'm talking about? Cool. That answer your question? All right. Any other questions? You guys are stretching me today. <laughs> All right, so Skyway Fishing Pier. What I would do with the Skyway Fishing Pier uh, myself is uh, uh, make sure that you're watching the tides. The tides are the biggest thing. Because out here, the, as long as the water's moving, you're going to be able to catch fish. Uh, definitely a spinning reel would be my go-to. Uh, the spinning reel helps a lot because you're going to have more uh, casting ability, you're going to have more sensitivity. Uh, I really prefer the spinning reel. As far as going to the Skyway, you want to catch a fish, you want to bend a rod. Spinning rod and reel, 20 pound test leader, about a 3 op hook or even 2 op hook and some live shrimp. Right on the start of an outgoing tide would be the best time to go or on the tail end of an outgoing tide. And you can even cheat, get there a little bit early uh, and get out there at like slack tide and get set up in an area and you can use something like the snapper up or the super shrimp, get some chunk going in the water. And at slack tide, that chunk's gonna fall straight down. And then as that water starts moving, those, that chunk's gonna start spreading out and those fish are gonna be right up, bubbled up underneath you. Right now, mangrove snapper are thick all over the bay and all over the mouth of the bay. Uh, at John's Pass, at Blinds Pass, at Passive Grill, Clearwater Pass, at the Skyway, at the uh, Fort DeSoto Fishing Piers, those mackerel or, or mangrove snapper are thick around the structure. Now, those inshore mackerel that we're talking about, they're 8, 10, 12 inches. They gotta be 10 inches to keep. So you are weeding through a few small ones to find that big fish uh, that's keeper size. But at the Skyway, they're seeing some big ones. Our big guy who catches our bait uh, commercially for us at the marina, uh, he's caught some 17, 18, 19 inch mangrove snapper that rival the ones that we see on our 39 hour trips out there at the Skyway. So it, there's definitely some big fish around Tampa Bay. The summertime, uh, from the end of May through early September, those uh, mangrove snapper are spawning. So they're in big aggregations and they're very, very prolific and aggressive. So it's a great time to go out there and target those mangrove snapper. Again, about two to three out hooks, small piece of shrimp, right at the start of that tide. The reason I say the start is because they're really quick biting fish. So similar to offshore fishing for mangroves, inshore fishing for mangroves, you gotta be quick, you gotta be able to feel that bite. But if the current's running really strong, you're not gonna have as good of a chance to feel that bite. It's such a quick bite and they're so smart. So you want to definitely hit it at the very start of that water movement. If the water's not moving, those fish aren't chewing. So if you hit it right at the start when they start feeding, you can get lucky and catch a few of them. I like personally my favorite method uh, to targeting those that style of smart fish would be the knocker rig setup where you have your egg sinker on your main line and that egg sinker is able to travel up and down your main line. The idea behind this is the further that egg sinker gets from your hook, the slower your bait descends to bottom. So this method works inshore, nearshore, offshore. 
you can transition 300 foot of water the same method as what I would use, obviously just a little bigger lead and bigger line, bigger hook. In this case, this was the uh, all right, the the mono, or the fluorocarbon leader here is shorter. Uh, this, but this same exact setup is what I was using for uh, 15, 20 pound red snapper, 250 foot of water. But I was using maybe like a 15 foot piece of fluorocarbon on top of the braid. In this case, this is more inshore efficient for snow, so I shortened it up. But at the skyway, I'd be using braided line for that increased sensitivity and about maybe eight. Uh, floral carbon on top of that gray, a little line and line on, and then probably about a half ounce or quarter ounce lead. You want to make sure you're using the lightest possible lead. Heavy enough to where you can feel the bite, but light enough to where it looks very natural going to bob. You can also, if the knocker rig's a little tough, because again, the further that lead gets from your hook, the more slowly the bait descends to the bottom, the more natural it appears, but also the harder it is to feel that bite because your lead's not right up against the hook. When the lead's right up against the hook, if a fish bites this, it's really easy to feel. Whereas when that lead gets really far away from the hook, the fish can pull on this thing all day long. It's not going to move your, the tip of your rod very much. So the, uh, the, the, the difficulty level is increased quite a bit. So knocker rig fishing is more natural, gives you a better presentation. You generally can catch a better quality fish, but it is more difficult. So you can cheat by increasing the size weight, making it fall at the bottom a little faster. That keeps that lead closer to the hook. It's easier to feel the bite. But if you want to start out, if you're not as experienced or you're taking your kids out there, uh, you can always do more of like the jig head method. The jig head method works great for mangrove snapper. And again, about 20 pound test, one of these jig heads and a little piece of shrimp or a half a green bag would be a great option for those mangroves as well. But right now, at the Skyway, mangrove snapper would be the thing that I talk Any other questions? Yes, sir. Good question. So uh, what he was mentioning was mangrove snapper at night. We do a 12-hour night mangrove snapper trip. We do 39-hour trips. We do 44-hour trips. But these are generally party boat fishing trips. Now, if we did a 12-hour night mangrove snapper private charter, I would probably be using some chumps, some of the snapper up, something like that, uh, on our big 60-foot uh, hatteras, the Mrs. Hub, one of our private charter boats. It's got underwater lights on it that we use when we're fishing at night for mangroves. But generally, on party boat trips, we don't chump. And sometimes we even get complaints about that. Like, the fishing might be a little slow if someone's out there. Why, why are we chumming? Well, you don't really chum on party boats because you have more lines in the water. When you get 15, 20 people dropping baits down to the box, that gets a lot of smell going in the water. You really don't need to chum. Plus, chumming a lot of times, especially out there in deep water, is very difficult. Because you have to remember, think like a fish. If you're dropping chum on the surface of the water, even if you're using a three ounce lead, sometimes that lead doesn't go straight down, right? Sometimes your three ounce lead can come out here at an angle and your bait's actually hitting the bottom 20, 30, 40, 50 feet away from the boat. So if you're dropping chum on the surface of the water, it doesn't got a three ounce lead on it. So as that chum drops to the bottom, a lot of times it's 60, 70, 100, 150, 200 feet away from the bottom of your boat. So offshore fishing in 60, 70, 80, 100, 150 foot of water, if you drop chum in the water, effectively you're moving those fish away from your hook. You're drawing them away from your hook. So offshore fishing, we don't chum a lot. When we do chum, it's when we have smaller crowds. If I got six, seven, eight, ten people on the boat, I might chum. But you have to be careful in the method that you use to chum. That's why I really like this Super Shrimp product because it's a hard pellet and it sinks super fast. So you can drop it in the water and it drops right to the bottom really easily. It makes it really, really easy to make sure that that chunk is directly under your boat where your lead and your weight is going to hit where you're targeting. Also, you could use the chum bomb method, kind of the old school trick that uh, we use a lot is uh, you 
there's two different methods to the chum bomb. There's one is you pre-mix your chum up and you put it in a red solo cup. Your wife's gonna love this, by the way. So you put it in a red solo cup and you take an egg sinker and you uh, put an egg sinker, or you take an egg sinker like this and you tie a, a loop of monofilament, maybe just just the size of a, uh, a grapefruit, a loop of monofilament. Drop the egg sinker in the red solo cup of the chum with that monofilament sticking out of the chum. Stick your red solo cup in the freezer at home next to tomorrow's dinner. And uh, that, that freezes overnight, and then you've got essentially a chum popsicle. You can take that offshore when you're ready to use it, throw it in the live well, it defrosts around the cup, you can pull it out of the cup, and you've got this chum popsicle. And you've got enough line sticking out of it where you can tie that onto your uh, line and drop it down the bottom. When it hits the bottom, that lead in the middle of that popsicle is going to hit the rock bottom that popsicle is going to break apart. Now, effectively, you've got your chum directly where you're going to fish. So that method works really well. Also, the chum bomb method is a little easier, a little less preparation. As you mix up your chum, and uh, what you would do is you would take your main line, and instead of putting, instead of hook, putting a hook on your main line, you would just take this, and you cut off this leader with the hook. So you would effectively just have a weight on top of a swivel. So you mix up your chum, and then you take a paper bag, put that paper bag, put about half, half, half fill it with uh, chum, and then you take that paper bag and you put it over this lead. Typically you put two or three leads on your line, so that way there's a couple of them, but it's nice and heavy. You put that paper bag up over those leads, and then you rubber band around the top of that paper bag just above the legs. And then you have basically a chunk sack on top of these legs. You could drop that down the bottom. But once you hit bottom with it, all you have to do is just lift your rod tip up and let it bounce on the bottom once or twice. And those legs are going to uh, hit together, break open that paper sack, and uh, create a nice little chum explosion uh, on the bottom where you're fishing. So that's another good method to use when you're offshore fishing. And you want to get chum down to your spot. Because so often I'll see, even on fishing shows, you'll see the guy on the fishing show take the chum and throw it off the back of the boat. That works great if you're chumming for yellowtail snapper and feeds in 25 foot of water. But if you're in 150 foot of water, that chum that you throw on the surface isn't going to hit the bottom until it's way far away from the boat. You're actually shooting yourself in the foot. So to answer your question, on our 12-hour night snapper, we don't chum. We just have a bunch of people dropping sardines and thread fins down to the bottom. And when you're dropping these sardines and thread fins down to the bottom, they got a lot of juice. He's, he's dripping juice right now. So if you get those 15 of those things going to the bottom, you get that scent going in the water. And when you catch that first fish, what happens when you reel those fish up from the bottom? They get that barrel chum. Everybody know what barrel chum is? For those of you who don't, barrel trauma is when you reel a fish up from the bottom quickly, it gets that gas expands in its stomach, and a lot of times its stomach will protrude out of its mouth when you reel it up. And what happens on the way to the surface that you're not seeing is all that food and guts and chum that was in its stomach gets regurgitated. So when you start catching those snapper, they're regurgitating all their food for the last couple of days up in the water column as you reel them to the surface. So that is some bad to the bone chunk right there. And it's happening right there on the bottom. So you get those snapper really excited. And that's why when you're mangrove snapper fishing, you get a really good bite of mangroves. You can fish on a spot for an hour and be catching the heck out of mangroves. And all of a sudden, it slowly tapers off. If a shark or a goliath grouper or a dolphin doesn't swim up, eventually the bite's going to slow down and stop by itself. And a lot of times, that's because those mangrove snapper are getting chummed up. Everybody's catching those fish that are here to take. So they're coming off the bottom, and they're coming up, and they're following that cloud of chum up into the surface. And sometimes you can even get them up to the bottom of the boat just by catching fish, catching fish. Uh, and that method, when that bite starts to slow down, the method that gets you that really, really big one is that knocker rig method. That's fishing that water column on the way down, and that big fish that's been chummed up off the bottom is going to hit that big bait as it slowly falls to the bottom of the knocker rig.
fun. So that, that's the answer. <laughs> they work well though, uh, mainly for uh, for macro snapper fishing at night. That double snell rig is imperative. Everybody know what a double snell rig is? If you don't know what a double snell rig is, you definitely want to wear it before you go macro snapper fishing. If you go on one of our 39 or 44 hour trips, we show you on the way out. Or on the 12 hour night trips, we talk about it as well. Uh, we have some videos on our website. Our websites, I think our website's pretty good. But if you haven't been there before, you can check it out. Uh, we have brochures up here once we're done with the website address on it. You can go on our website and go to fishing trips, and then click fishing tips. There's a ton of different videos, including how to tie one of these double snow rigs. Uh, and obviously we record a lot of these Bass Pro Shop seminars. We put all these on here too, so you can watch past ones. There's a bunch of different videos on the website. But this is a double snow rig. The double snow rig is super, super, super important when you're fishing for mangrove snapper because you're increasing your hookup ratio uh, 50%, if not more. So that double snow rig is really, really, really important when you're targeting these mangrove snapper. And I should have mentioned it before when you asked about uh, snapper fishing at the Skyway. So if I was fishing next to you at the Skyway, I would be tying on that uh, double, or I would be tying on that knocker rig with one of these double snow rigs. And you can use a green bag and use one of these double snow rigs. You put two shrimp, one shrimp on each hook, you know, and you can create that little feeding effect. But offshore, what we do with these double snow rigs is we take one of these. Uh, thread fins, and what we do with these thread fins, the start, you always want to make sure that you tear the tail off that thread fin, and then what we do as well, in addition to tearing the tail off on our mango snapper fishing, we'll also take the head off that thread fin, and then I'll also, on these thread fin, <laughs> Cliff, don't tell Cheryl what I did up here, okay? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so in addition to cutting that head off and cutting that tail off, we'll also trim out the belly cap. So that way, this nice wide bait started like this, and now it's like this because I've taken out that belly cap. So now we've got a nice big open chest cavity here, a lot of good scent going in the water. With this double snow rig, we take these hooks put it right perpendicular to the silver and blue line. And that first hook that's furthest from my leg, the first hook goes towards the thicker side of the bait, or what was the head. The reason why is this skinnier tail side of the bait, I want pointed at the leg. Because as this goes down the bottom, it's being dragged the bottom. So I want that skinnier side of the bait pointed at the leg because it makes it more hydrodynamic. There's less fin, there's less drag, it's gonna to get to the bottom more quickly and there's less of a chance of getting tangled up. A lot of people don't think about that when you're hooking your hook. You wanna make sure the skinnier end, the more hydro hydrodynamic end of the bait is pointed at your leg. So the first hook goes up towards the thicker side of the bait, right between that silver and blue line, perpendicular to the backbone. You pull it all the way through the bait till the hook comes out the other side. And then you turn the shank of that hook parallel to the back hook. The second hook goes right in behind that first hook, right behind the eye of that first hook. You've got to kind of move the scale out of the way sometimes. And again, perpendicular to the back hook, all the way through the other side of the bait, then you turn it parallel. So now I've got a nice, straight, beautiful chunk of meat that's nothing left on there but meat. So anywhere that macro snapper grabs, he's going to get meat. Uh, and he's also going to most likely get a hook in his mouth. The chances that he's going to have a hook in his mouth are increased because instead of one hook, I've got two hooks. And there's nothing there except for that yummy meat that's full of oil, full of good smells, and it's getting that bite. So that double snow rig with this, what I call, is a thread fin plug. All you've got left is that plug, that meat. And it works really well to get those fish excited. You drop that down the bottom, and those fish just start going nuts for it. Especially once you hook one, it gets that smell going in the water and you've, you've got that food chain started. A lot of times on the party boats, for example, you can start fishing a spot and 
that one guy, a lot of times may grow snappers. Attention Bass Pro Shop customers. Hang on, what is it? Heike Llewellyn, please report to customer service. With Heike Llewellyn, please report to customer service. Thanks. So a lot of times on uh, mangrove snapper especially, they're one of those fish that can separate that it, as a crew member or as a captain, you can stand back and you can identify the more experienced anglers more quickly because those mangrove snapper will really separate. Because the mangrove snapper is such a quick biting, smart fish, if you're able to catch mangrove snapper quickly and effectively and consistently, you're definitely a more experienced angler. And what will happen is, if you're standing there catching a bunch of mangrove snapper back to back to back, you're getting that chump line going and a lot of times they can... You want to hold it like that? Right? Right. Alright. So a lot of times what will happen is you'll get that chum line going underneath your feet and a lot of times you'll be catching mangrove snapper and no one else in the boat is catching them and they're not catching as many because you're literally getting the bite going underneath your feet. You're, a lot of times when I catch one, I'll cast back out in that same spot and I'll keep catching it. And all of a sudden you're catching five or six, seven mangroves while everybody else is looking at you like, what the heck is he doing? And all you're doing is you're making sure that you're presenting that bait naturally. You've got that double smell rig going, that thread fit plug, you're making sure that your uh, leader is nice and stretched out. You've got that really sensitive rod with that high gear ratio reel. We'll go over some of those tips real quick. Again, having a high gear ratio reel helps a lot. The higher the gear ratio, the quicker the retrieve, the more line that you're able to pull into that reel more quickly, so you're able to set the hook more effectively. So the higher the gear ratio, the quicker the retrieve. And having a quick, fast reel is gonna make catching and hooking mangrove snapper a whole heck of a lot easier. So a high gear ratio reel helps. Now, you can also nowadays go with these two-speed reels. Because a two-speed reel is like having two reels in one. It's like having one of these uh, fast single-speed reels, but with the click of the button, you can downshift, and it's like you've got one of these big, beefier, six-shot, slower reels in your hand, too. So these two-speed reels are great for that reason, especially when made grow snapper fishing, because that beautiful thread fin plug we just made Sometimes bigger fish grab it. So having the two-speed reel helps because you're able to downshift into a lower gear. And the lower the gear ratio, the slower the retrieve, but the more power you have. So having a two-speed reel helps for that reason. Let me show you something real quick. See where the lead's at? If, uh, I'm gonna show you the difference between a high gear ratio and low gear ratio. So you see where the lead's at right now? I'm gonna turn this handle one full revolution. So see how much that lead moved? It moved almost five feet there. Now, when we're gonna downshift, I hooked a big fish, and now I'm gonna downshift at the press of the button. Watch that lead this time. One more full revolution. Didn't move very much, did it? Only moved about a foot or so. And that is the difference between high gear ratio and low gear ratio. The low gear ratio retrieves less line uh, less slowly, but you have a whole lot more power. So the ability to switch gears helps a lot. Because when you're mangrove snapper fishing, I'm always in high gear ratio because I'm fishing 120, 150, 200 foot of water. I want to be able to retrieve a lot of line very quickly. So once I've got that fish hooked, if that's rod's bent, and that fish is taking drag, and it's a bigger fish than I expected, I'm able to press a button, downshift, and just adjust that drag a little bit. Now it's like I'm fishing a whole different reel. You're able to really gain a uh, line and get that fish to the boat. Whereas if you're using a single speed, high speed reel, you don't have much of a chance of landing that bigger fish that might pick up that thread from the boat. But as far as mangrove snappers specifically are concerned, all you need is that high gear ratio reel. And then just hopefully you won't hook that big fish while you're using it. Now also for mangrove snapper, you want to have a rod that's nice and light, has a really good sensitive tip, but it's also got a strong backbone. Because some of those mangrove snapper we catch out there in the deep water, they're pretty big and they can put up a good fight. So I like these custom rods uh, that we built because obviously I built them the way I built them for a reason. They're nice and light. You can see that tip is very, very sensitive. Uh, but it's also got a good backbone. Hold on to that left one. Real nice and tight. Yeah, 
Yeah, so you can see it's got a good backbone, it's got a nice light tip, but it's also pretty stiff there in the back. So that's the idea with these mangrove snapper rods. It's nice and light, but also nice and strong at the same time. Because that sensitivity is super important, especially when you're fishing out there in deep water. You want to be able to feel that bite. And as soon as you feel that bite, you got to start cranking because those fish are so fast. So it really, really helps to have that light, sensitive rod, that high gear ratio reel. Also for snapper, you want to make sure that you use the thinner wire hooks. Because if you're using these big old thick wire hooks, it's a lot harder to drive that hook into that fish's mouth. It's harder to hook. So a thinner wire hook makes it easier to hook that fish, easier to penetrate that fish's mouth, and your hook up ratio goes up quite a bit. So thinner wire hooks, that 4x strong hook, isn't what you want to use for that quick biting fish. You want to use that thinner wire hook. Everybody follow what I'm saying there? And then besides that, you want to make sure you're using floral part. For mangrove snapper, about 40, 50 pound test, about a 5 out hook is what I like using. Four to five out hook near shore. Offshore, about a five to six out hook, maybe 50, 60 pound floral carpet for those mangrove snapper out deep. All right? Any other questions, guys? I feel like you beat that one down pretty good. Yes, sir. Yeah. I can't quite hear you, I'm sorry. He wants to know to watch him somewhere. Uh, yeah, so um, as far as the Sunday night show goes, you don't have to have Facebook. You can log into it, watch it YouTube as well. Uh, so it's streamed to the Hubbard's Marina YouTube channel, and it's streamed to the Hubbard's Marina Facebook channel as well. And our Sunday night show, if you're not familiar with it, is we do it every Sunday night. It starts at 8.30 p.m. and runs to 9.30 p.m. We talk what, about what we've been catching. We show photos of what we've been catching. Then we go into uh, some videos from our captains and crew from that week. And then we answer your questions just like this. And it's uh, just an internet show, so you can watch it from your couch at home. And we give away lots of free stuff during the show as well. So it's just another fishing seminar that you can attend from anywhere because it's uh, streamed through Facebook and YouTube as well. So that's every Sunday night at 8.30 p.m. Thanks for that shameless plug. Anybody else? Any other questions? So real quick, we're going to talk about amberjack, if no one else has any questions, because amberjack fishing is what we're doing right now. Uh, with amberjack, you definitely want to use bigger reels, bigger tackle, bigger baits. So typically, a good 9-out reel or a really, really heavy drag reel, you're looking for something with 45, 50, 60 pounds of drag. You want something that's going to be able to stop that 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 pound fish. So a nice big, big reel, obviously your rod, you want to go a much, much heavier rod. Some people like those solid glass rods. They make a lot of these new fancier rods, especially these custom ones from Bull Day Rods that we have in our shop that uh, definitely have a lot of good backbone. Hold that one for me. So uh, you want to depth, whoa, I thought you had it. So you got it? So you definitely want to make sure you got something with a lot of backbone to it because these fish can pull really, really hard. Thanks, man. So uh, you want to make sure you got something with some good, good backbone. Uh, I like trying to find one as light as possible. And as far as the solid 100 pound glass rod, or, or solid 100 pound glass rod, it's about as light as I've found. Uh, because when you're fishing for those amberjacks and you're dropping down a three pound bait, a 10 ounce lead or a 12 ounce lead, you want to make sure that you're able to feel that bite. And sometimes those solid glass blue stick rods makes it really difficult to feel the bite. So some of this new technology that out, that's out there helps a lot. Besides the big reel and the heavy uh, industrial class rod, you want to make sure that you're using bigger weights because those big live baits, you want to make sure you're bringing them to bottom. Sometimes I'll see guys out there dropping down a one, two pound live bait and dropping down a six ounce lead. Well, that one, two pound fish 
could drag that lead. You don't want them to be able to do that. So heavier 10, 12 ounce leads help a lot. And then you want to use a longer leader. Generally, when I'm dropping down those big live baits for jacks, I'm using a six, seven, eight foot leader. Longer the leader, uh, the more room, or when I have more room, I'll use a longer leader. So if it's a lighter trip, and there's not as many people around, or I'm fishing a smaller boat with my buddy or a private charter, I'll use even an eight, 10 foot leader because I want that big live bait to get further from that huge 10, 12 ounce lead that I'm dropping down. You also want to make sure that you're using a really, really heavy, heavy duty hook. 10, 12 aught hook uh, works really well. And circle hooks generally, well, circle hooks, that's a rule. I'll show you how to use circle hooks. But circle hooks work really well for those amber jacks because that amber jack's going to come up and swallow that bait and start running. And a lot of times, he'll hook himself. All you have to do is hold on and set that hook. So what I do with the amberjack, that helps a lot, is when you're dropping that bait at the bottom, you don't drop it all the way to the bottom like you're a snapper fish. A lot of times what I'll do is I'll look over the side of the boat and I'll drop that live bait until I can't see it anymore. Once I can't see it anymore, I'm about halfway down generally, or a little less than halfway down, and I'll stop it. I'll stop it by putting my thumb on the spool. The reel is still in preschool, but I put my thumb on the spool to slow the descent. And what I'll do at that point is I'll just let a little bit of line out at a time, and I'll slowly drop that bait to bottom. The idea with that is I want to fish the top half of that water column because the biggest fish, whether you're fishing for red snapper, mangrove snapper, amberjack, any of those fish that come up off the bottom in schools, the biggest fish are always at the top or bottom of the water column. If I'm targeting a 60, 70, 80, or 90 pound fish, I'd much rather catch that fish closer to the surface. I don't know about you. So that's why I like dropping down really slow. So once I can't see the bait anymore, I stop it with my thumb, and then I drop down really slow. And once I start feeling that big live bait jump around and get nervous, I'll put it in here and fish it in. Because a lot of times you're able to catch that amberjack well before you have to get close to the bottom. And when you get that big fish going, you feel that bait jumping around and you feel that bite, you gotta let it eat. So a lot of times, once I really feel them start going, I'll even put it back in preschool and let them run a little bit. Especially if I know that I'm up off the bottom, there's no reason for me to start cranking right away and start trying to set the hook as fast as I would if, say, I'm fishing with a mango snapper. If I'm only halfway to the bottom or if I know that I'm up off the bottom, I might as well put it in preschool and let that fish run a little bit letting that bait get down in its throat, especially if you're using a big 10 and 12, 14 inch bait. You want to make sure that that amberjack has had a chance to get that bait down its throat and that hook in the side of his mouth. So I'll put my thumb on it and I'll keep pressure on it. It's not like I'm in total free school and he's able to do whatever he wants and backlash me. I still keep pressure on him, but I'm not putting it in gear and letting that drag pull on. So once he's got a solid hook set, I'm confident that he has that bait down his throat, I'll throw that reel into gear and that's when I start putting the heat on it. Now with Amberjack, you want to make sure you're setting the drag right. Super important that you set that drag properly. For Amberjack, for Gag River, for any of those big fish, you want to make sure your drag is set properly. Now right now, my drag should be pretty loose because this, this reel, I'm not out fishing right now. I loosened it up so I can store it. Now for Amberjack, for Gag, or for Amberjack specifically, I want a little lighter drag. And the idea behind that is those Amberjack generally are going to run out away from the boat. So, or not out, not always out away from the boat. Sometimes they run under the boat. But they're not running you to the bottom like a Gag Grouper would. A Gag Grouper is going to run you into this rock and break you off. Amberjack generally run above the bottom, will run somewhere, but they're generally not going under a hole or under a ledge to break you off. So you generally can let Amberjack run a little bit more, especially if you're fishing at, say, a spring. When you're fishing at a wreck, if that wreck has a lot of superstructure, he's able to run you into the wreck and break you off, so you have to tighten up your drag a little bit. But if you're fishing on a spring, there's nowhere for that Amberjack to break you off, can get tangled up, so if there's more people around you, you can tighten up your jag. But if you got the room, you don't want to lock down that jag because that fish, when you put more pressure on that line, 
there's more of a chance that a hook's going to break, uh, a, an abrasion's going to happen, and that line's going to separate, or you're going to pull that hook from the fish's mouth. So when you have the ability to, let them run, let them eat that drag up, let them tire himself out before you bring them to the boat. But to start off, generally what I'll do is I'll wrap my line around my hand twice, and when I pull that line out, I want to be able to see that. See that line indention on my hand? If you're not seeing that, it's not tight enough. But if you're not able to pull that line out of that reel, you're not, it's not, if, if you're not able to pull the line out of the reel, it's too tight. You want to make sure that that fish has the ability to pull your drag, especially that amber jack, because you do want them to be able to run. You don't want to just lock down that drag, because that fish is generally going to break, uh, break your hook, break the knot, or break the line, or just pull the hook out of its mouth. So you want that drag loose enough, like 75%. You want it tight enough to where he's not able to run anywhere he wants to but it's uh, also loose enough to where it's not going to pull the hook out of the corner of its mouth. Those jacks don't have a super bony mouth like the gags in the group do. They're able to pull that hook a lot easier, especially with how hard they fight. Also, you want to make sure that you're using mono. A lot of people like that braided line. Braided line works really well when you're snapper fishing for that increased sensitivity, when you're trolling, if you want to get that lure deeper, when you're vertical jigging, because you need more sensitivity, when you're deep drop fishing, you need to be able to cut through the water better. But when fishing for big grouper or amberjack, monofilament is king. The reason why is it has that stretch. That braided line doesn't have that stretch, which is a good thing in some cases, but as far as amberjack fishing, when that fish is shaking its head, making big dives, if you're using braided line, you're beating yourself up. You're gonna have a huge bruise up underneath your arm, and generally you're gonna lose more fish. Reason why is he's able to tear that hole in the side of his face, and he's able to spit your hook more easily. If you're using that monofilament, there's more stretch in it. Not only is your rod bended, not only are you giving that fish a line when the drag's pulling, but also that line is physically stretching, so it's a, a more of a shock absorber. Less of a chance for that fish to tear that hole and spit your hook. So that monofilament definitely works well when you're targeting those bigger fish. Uh, generally, no, because uh, his question was, will fluorocarbon help, or a fluorocarbon leader help with that braided line issue? Uh, generally, no, because that leader is so short. Over the distance of the line, that's where you're getting that shock absorption. So if only four feet of the 100 feet of line in your water is fluorocarbon or braid or monofilament, you're not seeing that benefit. Generally, I would, I would tell you never, ever, I can't think of one situation where I would have braided line to my swim. Now, I'll always have a top shot. Now, sometimes that top shot's really small, but I always have a top shot. But what a top shot is, is a top shot is a leader before your leader is how you can explain uh, So in the case, this is my mangrove snapper deep water reel. So it's filled with braided line. But you'll notice here, here's my leader. You've got my swivel, my, my double snell rig, and my weight. But above that weight, that's monofilament right there, not braid. But when I cast this sucker out there, uh, after still on out, still on, there it is. There's the line to line. So I'm up to how far is that? I take myself up. So that's, I don't know, maybe 40 feet there of monofilament, or in this case, formal carbon. And the idea with that is that's my shock. This also ensures that that mangrove snapper or whatever I'm targeting on the bottom can't see my braided line. This also is my shock absorber to make sure he can't tear that hook and spit my hook. This also makes sure that if I got some goo next to me who tangles me up, I'm able to untangle my line because when I feel that tension, I can reel up really fast and I can make sure that I can untangle it. Because what happens when you get braid tangled? All you can do is cut that braid. So you want to make sure that you have that top shot for that reason too. And also, it just generally makes sure that you don't lose as many fish. A lot of times when that braid first came out, I was real excited, like, oh, there's something some cool new that we can try. 
And a lot of guys switch to that graded line, but you would start reeling a fish up from the bottom, and all of a sudden it would come off. That happens a lot when you're fishing that straight grade. Also, what will happen is when you're dropping the bottom, when you're dropping the bottom, your bait comes up to your main line. Your bait does this automatically, because your bait on your hook creates drag. So as your bait comes up to your main line, that graded line, a lot of times will get tangled around your weight or tangled around your bait. So if you're fishing braid right to your swivel, a lot of times you're gonna reel up and your lead's all tangled up, or your hook's all tangled up, and that's not gonna be as effective. Because the idea with these slip leads, you always wanna fish a slip lead. Never, ever, ever grab those leads with the swivel on either side. That's more old school method, and it does not work as well. The idea with this slip leg is that egg sinker can sit on the bottom, and that fish can breathe on my hook, and I'm gonna feel it on my tip of my rod, because when that line's tight enough to feel this lead, but not disturb it on the bottom, even if I barely move that swivel, my tip of my rod's moving. And that's the benefit of having a light sensitive rod and using that braided line because I have that increased sensitivity. But it all happens thanks to this egg sinker, this slip lead. Because if I had a swivel or if I tied this lead on my line, that fish has to hit this hook hard enough to move that six ounce lead before I'm able to feel the light. So that slip, that slip lead, having that main line slip through that egg sinker make sure that I don't have to uh, have that fish disturb my hook hard enough to move the lead before I feel the bite. So your sensitivity increases tenfold. So you always want to make sure you have that slip leg. Any other questions, guys? Are you using the on your amber jet rod? Or are you using the Yeah, amber jack, gag grouper, straight mongoose, definitely. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, for amberjack, generally about a 100 pound test, 80 to 100 pound test, depending on how deep you're fishing. Uh, and you need to be able to reach the bottom, obviously. So if you don't have a really big reel, sometimes you'll have to go with 80 pound mono. But with one of these big old 9 ounce reels, I've got plenty of room in that reel. I use a 100 pound test main line, and I'm able to hit the bottom fine. And I'm also very confident in the ability of myself to land that fish. I'll use a 100 pound main line and about a 125 pound meter on average with about a 12 watt hook, maybe 10 to 12 ounce lead depending on the size bait and the current out there. Because the heavier main line, it also makes it a little bit more difficult to make sure your line's going straight to the bottom. So you have to use a heavier weight when you're using that heavier main line, especially when you've got that big bait going down the bottom. Any other questions? Good question. Uh, his question was, do you recommend mono for all types of fishing? Generally, uh, myself personally, I prefer to use mono when I'm bottom fishing offshore. Now, there's certain situations when I'm snapper fishing, I like using braided line with that mono or floor part of the top shot. When I'm vertical jigging, I like using braided line with a very short, maybe eight, 10 foot top shot because I want to be able to have that jig work. If you've got a bunch of stretch in your line, that jig's not going to work. So that, that vertical jig that you're dropping down the bottom, if, it, if your line's stretching, that thing's not moving as much. It's not working as hard. So braided line is very, very important when you're vertical jigging. When I'm uh, trolling, I'll use braided line. Now typically, to fill up a big trolling uh, reel costs. $300 to braid the line, it's crazy how much it is. So what I'll do is I'll fill the reel up with monofilament, uh, and then I'll put a little bit of braid on top, and that braid is the braid that's actually in the water when I'm fishing, maybe 200 yards, 300 yards of braid, uh, just so I can get that lure deeper in the water. Uh, so trolling, vertical jigging, also if I'm flat line, my pitch rod, my flat line rod or my pitch rod, I'll have braided line in that because it's typically a spinning reel and I want more line capacity if I hook that big fish. So when I'm worried about sensitivity, getting deeper into the water when I'm trolling, the line capacity, those are three areas that I would prefer to use braided line. Yeah, braided line is going to cut through the water better. It doesn't have memory in it, so it's a lot easier on the trolling uh, spool. And then it also, 
doesn't have that stretch, so that's why it works better for vertical change. But those same benefits work against you when you're bottom position. So that's why you're using the top shot or you're using the bottom. Do you have a brand body uh, I really like the Berkeley Prospect or that Andy. Uh, it's like a gray Andy. I think it's Andy Tournament. Andy makes a tournament grade, they make a, a product called Batman too. Yeah. And uh, the, if you buy tournament line, be, be aware of that it's it's, tournament. it has to test at that strength. So if you buy a 60 pound tournament, it's got to be a, so if you, unless you care about that, avoid that stuff. Buy Andy Premium or Andy Backcountry. And Andy it'll, Premium, and that's it'll it. It'll test high yeah. or use Memoy. Yeah, Mamoy, Mamoy, the dark purple one's great. The Andy Premium, the gray, dark gray, I like a lot. And then uh, the Berkeley Prospect has like a really crazy. I, I find mine filament because I'll, I'll be fishing on a party boat. Someone's hung in the bottom, and I'll go try to break them out of the bottom, and I'll come up on a line that I just can't break. And it's really difficult to break, and then I find out what kind of line that is, and I start using it. Mamoy is definitely one of the stronger ones from the Berkeley Prospect and the Andy Creek. I've been off for offshore trolling and I use Andy Pink. Yeah. I was going to say the pink they don't see. You like gray? Uh, to me, the colors on lures on line are made to catch you when you're walking down the aisle at the tackle shop. Uh, generally, I just use my rule of thumb as going more natural. So to me, the water's definitely a little darker when you're getting down there in the deep water. Uh, it is a fact that the color red and the pinks, they, the fish can't see that. When you, when you go down under the water, that color red is lost. When you drop a camera down at the bottom, everything looks blue because that color red is lost. So that's scientific, that that, that red, that red uh, hue can't be seen on the bottom. So uh, pink works fine. We use pink on all of our boats. That's what you buy in bulk. That's pretty much the only color they offer. But me specifically, I like the grays or the dark blues, the dark purples. But it's really just personal preference. White works, clear. I don't use neon purple or neon green. Those, those neon colors are great for trolling rods when that line isn't near the bottom. The high vis stuff definitely would never use that. But uh, it works as long as you have that top shot. If you're going to use 50, 60 for the top shot, you can use high vis. But yeah, don't have high vis line going down to use for it. As far as braided line, I really like spider wire myself. But Berkeley makes good products. Uh, everybody, there's not there's not a lot of bad products out there. Right you get what you pay for ultimately. You go to that knockoff stuff, some of that stuff can be pretty bad. But I like Andy and the control with mono. Yeah. Andy's been around a long time. If you can stand the test of time, you're a good, good product here. Any other questions? Uh, my buddy that catches a lot of grouper out at the Skyway says the South Span is better, but it's generally, it's just time of year in certain areas and find that one hole that has them. Uh, and it's also definitely has a lot to do with the time of year. We were talking a little earlier, uh, and at the cooler times is when those grouper come in closer. So in October, November, December, you can, a lot of people can catch that grouper consistently out of the Skyway piers. This time of year, you gotta really know what you're doing, and you gotta know where to do it to catch those gags out of the skyway. But if you wanna catch really big gags right now, this time of year, 200 foot of water, 250 foot of water. Any other questions? We're just about out of time. What? I don't know, philosophy, but like when you troll it, the blue water out there, I like the crimp rather than the yellow. Uh, I always prefer to tie, generally. The only time I crimp is when I can. If I'm using a 200, 250, 300 pound test, then you can't tie a knot, you would crimp. But my personal opinion, I always, less is more, lighter is better, and also the more natural it is, the better. So the less terminal tackle I have on my leader, the better I feel about it, the more I can consistently catch fish. Because just like inshore fishing, whatever you're confident in is what's going to work best for you. 
So if you're confident in the crimps, keep crimping. But me, myself, I like the nail knot. That's 99.9% of the time when I tie a knot, it's a nail knot. Unless I'm doing a line-to-line -line knot, then obviously I can't do a nail knot. Or unless I'm doing a loop knot, then I can't do a nail knot. Or I'm double snelling, then it's only a snell knot. But if I'm tying a swivel, or I'm tying a single hook on my leader, it's always a nail knot. Any other questions? Just about out of time, we'll take one more. A double uni knot is what I use for a long, long time. That's what I grew up using. That's what it's easy, it's fast, works well. The problem with the double uni knot is it's thick. So in the case of these top shots and these new fancier rods, like this spinning rod that I have, I love this rod. It works really well, it casts for a mile, it's super light, super strong, sensitive. But these newer rods have these really small guides. And those small guides, the reason they do that is so you cast smoother, line goes through the rod smoother, the rod is also stronger. But it makes it really difficult for a line to line knot to go through your guides, so you've got to go thinner. So a double uni knot doesn't work on some of those fancier rods with those thin guides. So generally my line to line knot is kind of one of three. The double uni knot is a really good one if you're in a hurry and you're confident in it. But uh, the Alberto knot is what we've kind of gone to. If, if I'm in a rush and the bike's on, I'll use an Alberto knot because it's super fast. Uh, my favorite is definitely what I've been using the most is the reverse Albright knot. Uh, it takes a little bit of time. It's one of those knots that I would tie on the way out or at home. Uh, the FG knot is by far the strongest, uh, but it definitely takes a little bit of time and practice to perfect that. And then in some of the trolling tackle, then you get a whole different array of knots, like the PR bobbin knot. You have, literally have to have a bobbing tool, a lighter, and a, a pick, and a magnifying glass to, to tie that one. So that's not something you do on the boat. Uh, but the PR bobbin knots, hands down, the strongest. It's a 100% strength knot. Uh, and then the FG knots right there with it, and then followed by all the rest. But the uni to uni is a great knot, works well. It's just a little too thick if you're doing a line to line knot for uh, top shot. So the reverse all right on the FG, that's what you want to go to. If you can spend the time, if you're going to pick one line to line knot to learn, learn the FG knot. It's super strong, it's super thin, it works well. All right, guys. Yeah. Trout. Sea trout are pretty year round, but right now the sea trout bite's not as good because in the summer they get a little tough. Early morning you can find them, late afternoon you can find them. In the cooler months they bite a little bit more aggressively. But right now with your deeper grass flats are going to have your sea trout. You're seeing the drop offs, your passes, those points, pockets, passes. That's what you're looking for. All right, guys, so we're going to do that drawing, and uh, these guys are going to talk a little bit about the club uh, as well. But real quick, I want to remind you guys, as we talked about earlier, our live show every Sunday night, 8.30 p.m. You can look us up, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. I run our social media accounts, so if you ever have a question, you can shoot us a question through our Facebook page. Just simply search Hubbard's Marina. If you think of something on the drive home that you want an answer to, shoot me a message to the Hubbard's Marina Facebook page. Uh, Instagram, YouTube, we put a lot of YouTube videos out. We do daily, almost daily videos uh, talking about what's happening now, what events we have coming up, what we've been catching. We put those videos on our Facebook and our YouTube pages, so make sure you stay tuned to that. Also, uh, we do have a lot of events coming up. If you're not a Facebook or YouTube person, you can go on our website. These brochures up here, guys, have our website on the bottom. And on our website, you can click Fishing Trips. Uh, under the Fishing Trips tab, we have the Weather Links page. If you're sitting there thinking, hey, man, I'm never fishing with you. I got my own boat. That's great. The website's still a great resource for you because we got the Weather Links. We got weather apps. We've got all our fishing tips pages with a lot of different colorful videos, how to tie these knots, how to do the double snow rig. And then also, all our Bass Pro seminars are on there, and we have our live Q&A, the Sunday night shows are all on there too. So there's a lot of helpful resources there on the website for you. Plus, you'll find the events tab, which has all our Bass Pro Shop seminars and all the uh, different events that we have going on throughout the month. So you can follow us on there too. 
if you don't have the social media, just use the website. All right, I have my cards up here. After we're done, guys, feel free to stick around, come up, chat with me. Uh, I'd be happy to show you some of these rocks, some of these knots, or some of the tackle that we talked about. Got it all laid out up here. Uh, so feel free to come up and join me after.